um, about, this is about child protection. So let me tell you of a GP up in Perthshire who is turning away parents who are, it's the parents by the way, not the kids. Parents who are bringing their children. Who are saying, oh we want gender reassignment surgery and different things, which you can't actually do. But she says, when I turn them away, she says, I'm not going to give them treatment that's going to wreck their bodies. But they go to Glasgow. There's a huge waste place. 40% of the teenagers who are um, going for this kind of treatment suffer from Asperger's. There are other mental health issues involved here. And the big thing is the internet. So YouTube is, is feeding this stuff to people. There are numerous YouTube communities uh, which is doing phenomenal harm. Now paradoxically, we're living in a society where if you advocate praying for somebody who is homosexual, you could be banned. And if you advocate mutilating someone's body in order to help them with the, the, what is a genuine psychological disorder, then you're lauded and you're praised. As I'm saying, it's, 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 it, it is mad. Um, the best context in which to bring up a child from birth to adulthood is within the context of a family. And that's, I think, our big thing. I mean, there are families that it's not so great, um, and there are many, many difficulties. But there's numerous research. So, for example, for couples with children, the dissolution rate for same-sex couples is more than double that of heterosexual couples. Um, as regards to the transgender issues, 80% of teenagers who would say that they were transgender by the time they're in their 20s revert to their birth gender. And by the way, look how we have to use language. The Times, forgive me for this, not the Times, the Guardian, in a couple of articles referred to women, not as women, but as menstruators. The latest one, BBC Radio 4, Today programme, two days ago, not cis women and so on, talk of natal women. So a natal woman is someone who's born a woman. And then there are trans women. But the phrase is trans women are women, so are trans women not natal women. I mean, it's just, you, 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 the, the big loser here, by the way, is feminism. And a lot of the abuse occurs, occurs from men, <coughs> trans men who say that they are women, against women. The girl, the guys. I wouldn't let my ch child go to the guys. Why? Because the guys now have a policy that if a man identifies as a woman and becomes a guy leader and wishes to go on a camp and sleep in a tent with girls, then you don't tell the parents. You know? I mean, we fill out all kinds of health and safety forms, all kinds of child protection stuff. And then this happens. So we, we need to be careful how we look and all that. Um, I do think that transgender people need help, but let's take Aaron, an 18 year old and former young offenders accused of two rapes. Now says there's a woman called Alexis. Women prison officers have been asked to do rub down searches on him. They've refused. They've been threatened with the law. Other female prisoners are concerned because in Pullman's it's open access women's cells. So they put a convicted rapist into a woman's prison where women can't escape. It's bad. Absolutely bad. But so is this. This is from the American College of Pediatricians. Conditioning children to believe in a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex is normal and helpful is child abuse. Endorsing gender discordance as normal via public education and legal policies will confuse children and parents, leading more children to present to gender clinics where they'll be given puberty blocking drugs. These in turn virtually ensure that they will choose a lifetime of carcinogenic and otherwise toxic cross-sex hormones and likely consider unnecessary surgical mutilation of their healthy body parts as young adults. I'll put it very simply and very straightforward. And I've said this to the Scottish Government and they called me in because I said it. Uh, I was interviewed by the civil servants throwing up the legislation. Here's the irony, I know that they agreed with me, but they couldn't do anything. Nobody, everyone's like, nobody, 
Nobody seems to be able to do anything. When the Scottish Government say they're going to enforce and promote a radical culture which says that children can choose their own gender, they are engaging in organised, systematic, state-enforced child abuse. And that has enormous implications, especially for younger parents who are considering what do we do when our children go to school. And by the way, because of the TIE the project, Time for Inclusive Education, they are desperately trying to ensure that none of us are allowed to have our children removed from that. And it is absolute indoctrination and abuse. And I've called it state-sponsored child abuse. <coughs> and I'm afraid it is. I think this has a huge impact on society as well, um, in different ways. Political freedom and <coughs> democracy. We live in a democracy which we take for granted, which is based upon Christian principles of tolerance, diversity, and the rule of law, where we're all equal under the law. Now, it's important to grasp this. The way that we are going, although the words used are tolerance and diversity, that's not what they mean. Because the most intolerant people just now are those who are arguing for tolerance. I've actually been told that I should be banned in the name of tolerance. You, you try and work out in what world that makes sense. And freedom? You are free to say whatever you want, as long as it agrees with what we say. You know, we're moving towards what I call the Henry T. Ford approach to democracy. What color would you like your car? You can have any color you want as long as it's black. And that goes in terms of education, it goes in terms of everything else. Now there's a price to pay for Christians for this. So as a Christian, I am prepared to say, of course people should be free to work. Freedom of religion is absolutely crucial. And if Muslims wish to worship, I think that they are wrong. I think their religion is wrong. But they have the right to do that. People have a right to be atheists. People have a right to bring up their children. But what's happening in our culture is the state is replacing God and is becoming the ultimate parent. Now, this is a technical term, so please don't be too horrified. This Nicola Surgeon is described as the chief mummy for Scotland. Now that's because under the care system that's done, she's the, and I, I accept that and I understand that, but what bothers me is the type of chief mother or whatever. That's so Orwellian and actually indicative of what is happening. In Canada just now, I think it's Ontario, you may be correct me on this, it is Ontario, isn't it, who have just passed a law saying that if a parent refuses to support their child's transgender or self-gender identification, the child can be removed for abuse from the parents. You know, that will come here. There's no question. But this never ever stops, by the way. You think, well, we'll give them this, we'll give them this, we'll give them this, we'll give them this, and then it'll be, that'll be the end of it. It's never the end of it. It's, it's a spiral of destruction. And that's where we're at. And I think there's a cost in the legal system. Um, there is, a, in, in our police service, which is rapidly, after it's been centralized, become politicized. We now have Thought Police. Uh, police Scotland have their own LGBT liaison officers, 90 of them to deal with hate crime, who are going to be trained by the Equality Network, who are funded by the Scottish Government to tell the Scottish Government to do what the Scottish Government has already decided to do. So I want to know why are there not trained police officers having to deal with anti-Christian hate crime? I think of the churches that have been vandalized, I think of the Christians who have been beaten up, I think of those who have been discriminated against, but of course that doesn't count. So um, I reported the police to themselves for hate crime, and they basically, they have a law, this is honestly, this is their position, this is crazy, they say a hate crime doesn't matter what happens, if the person who is the victim, and they've already decided they're the victim, perceives it to be a hate crime, it is a hate crime, or a hate instance. So I reported the police to the police for their own poster about religious people and, and said it was a hate incident. And they said, no, it wasn't. The Scottish government didn't mean that. That's literally what they said to me. And I replied, I said, I don't care. Your law says, how do I feel? I'm the victim. And I think it's a hate crime. So it is. And they said, no, it's not. And it won't be recorded as one. By the way, hundreds and thousands of people reported them for the same thing following that example. None of it was recorded as hate crimes. See, when you get all these figures about hate crimes, they are highly selective. Highly so. Now, again, we as Christians, we're utterly opposed to hate. You know, I don't hate 
people who have different points of view. Not at all. And I think there's a cost coming in terms of the legal system. Uh, there is a cost coming in terms of media and general culture. Uh, today, in addition to the leaders of the three or five major political parties in Scotland, four ministers in the Scottish Government are openly gay. Yesterday, the Parliament boasted it was the gayest Parliament in the world. It's an actual boast. It's a paradox, but it's reckoned that there are also more evangelical Christian members in the Scottish Parliament than in any other Parliament in Western Europe. That's fascinating. And uh, what can be done with that, I don't know. But we now have protected beliefs where it's become illegal to refuse to promote them if you don't agree with them. Which is just utterly, utterly bizarre. But as I said before, I think the most extraordinary thing is the focus on education and the indoctrination through education. And my simple advice to parents is simply this. I went to our school and our kids were going, I said, if you teach anything in this school that goes against what they're being taught in the church, I'm taking them out. And I'm suing you for religious discrimination. Because believe it or not, you have a right under the UN Charter of Human Rights to have your children educated according to your philosophy. That's a basic human right. And it's one that's being eroded and taken away within our country. Um, I think there's a cost in terms of economics. It costs between 40 to 50,000 pounds per year for each child refugee taken into care. Now I think we should take child refugees, real refugees. But what's the cost to society of the dysfunctional homes within our culture? Because here's another paradox for you. It's our ABs, our better off classes, who are advocating this sexual inverted commerce liberalism so they can sleep with who they want. But they are, 80% are likely to be married in stable marriages. It's the DEs, working class people, who are only 40% likely to be in stable marriages. And that's wrecking havoc in our students. Absolutely wrecking havoc. So this bourgeois sexual morality is oppressing the poor. And that should be a major concern for us. But there is a phenomenal economic cost. I have a friend who works in childcare. He told me there's one family in our city that their four boys have cost so far per year almost a million pounds to deal with because they have to bring in outside agencies, they don't have enough and so on. And I know a lot of people in social services, there's a huge change occurred that our, our, our city councils or local councils used to see themselves as service providers. Now they see themselves as service purchasers. And even then, it's only statutory services. So the, 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 the welfare net as we have it is, is rapidly disappearing. And a huge reason for that is because of the collapse in the family and the collapse of morality. And that you can do anything you want. Which works okay if you've got loads of money for a while. But doesn't work amongst others. So, there's legal, there's, uh, never mind, we'll leave that one just now, the Asher's case, of course, there's education, uh, there's a, a poster for you, you can see, this was uh, from a teacher, took it in my city, from a primary school class of eight to nine year olds, mum and daddy was love, auntie and uncle was love, foster mum and foster daddy was love, mum was mum equals love, dad was dad's boyfriend equals love, it's all love, love is all you need, love is great, love is fantastic. What about dad plus son? What about, and you say, that's gross, absolutely gross, yes. But there's a professor in Columbia University in the United States who's suing to be able to marry his own daughter on the grounds that they love each other. Do you know what the British government told me? They wrote a letter in which said, we believe that any two people who love each other should be able to marry. That's their basis for legal law. In that case, I can marry my son. You know? And then they say, oh well, what, what, where's all this going even in terms of, of, of pedophilia and everything else? Well, let me just mention that. I mentioned the economics. Transhuman. That's going to be the next big thing. You know, put in, We've all got different bits. My, my dad has loads of bits. And my dad's in his 80s and he's got... I think he's like the bionic man, the different bits he's got. But that's not what we need. 
mean genetic engineering. Transable, what's that? Well, I feel that I'm disabled. And there are places in the world that you can go. If you feel you're disabled, you can ask for a leg to be chopped off. Why not? That's what you are. That's what you feel you are. You know? Uh, polyamory or polygamy. Well, it's already here. But there is no reason at all for it not to become legal. I uh, are, held a, um, a hustings at our church. And, you know, politically neutral. And the Green leader at the time in the UK had said that she would be for polygamy. And I asked each of the candidates, what did they think about that? Very impressed with the Lib Dem, who happened to be a Mormon, actually, who was very against, which I thought was interesting. Um, the Labour guy, Catholic background, totally against. Tory guy, totally against. And then the man who was to become our SNP MP uh, said, I don't see what's wrong with it. In some cultures, it's normal. And he was meaning Muslim. And he didn't want to be seen as Islamophobic. And he actually said that. And the next day I got a phone call from the Daily Mail saying, someone on the continent said, he said he was for, is this true? And I said, yes, it is true. And he said, well, we've contacted SNP headquarters. They completely deny it and say it's a lie. I said, unfortunately, we've got it recorded. <laughs> it didn't run on the story. But that's where it's going. I mean, I don't blame him. It's only consistent. Why, why would you reject? If, if, if it's okay for two people who love each other to marry, why can't three people who love each other marry? Or four, or five, or ten? And then incest. Oh, incest is never going to happen again. Why not? Oh, it's normal in lots of other cultures. It's normal amongst animals. That's the argument that's always used, isn't it? Oh, well, animals do it. Well, we animals do lots of things. I grew up on a farm where um, mother pigs would often eat their little ones. Does it justify cannibalism amongst humans? No. But incest does happen. It will happen. And here's how it will happen, by the way. You will get in soap operas, just bit by bit, stories that make you sympathetic towards the characters. Bestiality and pedophilia. Pedophilia, here's, a, here's an interesting one, culturally. If you go back to the 1970s, and now we know Jimmy Savile. By the way, it turned out Mary Whitehouse was right. But you go back to the 1970s, and you look at the way the culture was going in the early 1970s, you had someone like Harriet Harman, who belonged to a group which advocated what they called man-boy love and so on. You had popular novels like Shogun, which said this is what the Japanese do. You know, they have sex with children, and which is a Western cultural thing, and all different cultures are vile, vile, and vile, vile, all different cultures are vile, all different cultures are valid. And, uh, and then for some reason, and I do not know the reason, I just regard it as the mercy of God, we were heading towards a society where a lowering of sex age would, would have been normal. And then for some reason, by 1979, pedophilia became the absolute sin. And it has remained so for about 30 years or more. But I think that's changing. And let me explain why. I did a debate 20 years ago up in Aberdeen about gay adoption. And, you know, it's funny how our society has moved on since then. Because now NHS Scotland are going around gay clubs trying to urge people to get gay adoption. But today, Barnardo's, a Christian charity, inverted commas, phoned us up in St. Peter's and asked, said, Dave, we'd really like to operate you in adoption in Dundee and we want you to help us. And I said, yeah, we'd love to do that. I knew that Bernardo's views weren't my views, but I thought adoption was something like that. I got a phone call a week later. You know what they said? They said, David, I am so, so sorry. Um, we can't cooperate with you. And I said, why not? So my, our, our board won't allow us to because of your views in same sex marriage. So they're prepared. When they talk about equality, it's not equality. They were prepared to let children suffer for the sake of their ideology. And that really is what a huge amount of this is about, by the way. It is only their ideology. But I did this debate on um, uh, same-sex adoption. And afterwards, I'm standing with my opponent. It was a civil debate. It was fine. And some of Peter Tatchell's followers came up and started arguing with me. And I asked them about Peter Tatchell's view of lowering the age of consent. The gay age at that point was 18 years. Um, 
heterosexual at 16 years. And I said, what about his idea of lowering the age of consent to 14? And they said, oh, we don't agree with that. I said, good. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't think Peter goes far enough. There shouldn't be an age of consent. I said, say that again. I said, there shouldn't be an age of consent. I said, I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old child. What are you telling me? And this is what they actually said to me. They said, dude, if we were babysitting your children, we would teach them to experiment sexually. Now, my opponent stood beside me. He said, oh, guys, you're way out of line. I don't agree with you at all. But I turned to him and said, this is where you're heading. And think about it logically. We're telling five-year-olds they can choose their gender. Why can't they choose sex? Oh, they're not capable of choosing. Yes, they are. They're capable of choosing to change their gender. That's what you're saying. There are academics who argue that six-year-olds should be able to vote. So why not? And when both views are valid, why not? You're saying, well, that's just a, a hellish position. And it is. It's from the pit. It's awful, but it's where it's heading. You see, what we're doing is we are not progressing to a secular Nirvana. We are regressing to the Greco-Roman pagan world where children were used sexually, where there was infanticide. By the way, yesterday, I just noticed that the US Democrats, with the exception of three, voted to veto a bill which prevents born children from being killed who are supposed to have been aborted. They just vetoed something that's to do with infanticide. And unquestionably, that's the level where we are going. And I think, why I think pedophilia will come in is simply this. This is what will happen. First of all, it will be recognized as a sexual orientation, which it is. There are already several people who've argued for this. Secondly, the idea of consent will be reduced more and more and more. If we can have 11-year-olds marching and telling us how to save the planet, then surely they can consent for sexual things. And the logic of the argument is inexorable. Really, it's, 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 you cannot defeat that argument, I don't think. And right now, we've still got the yuck factor. But, for some of you, you remember the yuck factor with homosexuality. Yuck factors change according to culture. And you will see more and more sympathetic portrayals of child, boy, child-adult relationships. And I do think child sexual abuse is a phenomenal thing that's going on. And one of the ways it's happening is this. 40% of 10-year-olds, 10-year-old boys in my city have seen on their phones extreme hardcore pornography. And I'm talking about stuff that I couldn't even mention without feeling physically sick. What do you think that's done to their heads? What do you think that's done to their brains? That's where the child abuse is occurring in our society. Just to me, doesn't seem to care. We're losing rationality, logic, and truth. We're losing family, church, and society. And I think we're losing love, peace, and goodness. I really do. I think we're, we're heading into a real pit. So how do we react? Um, you could be afraid. There's a sense of uh, failure. And I think there is failure. I think you, we have got evangelicals, supposed evangelicals like Steve, Steve Chalk announcing they're going to do a transgender naming ceremony. We've got the Church of England bishops saying that the baptismal liturgy can be used for people who want to change transgender, as though gen tra changing gender is equivalent to being baptized by Christ. I, breathtaking. The Church does that. By the way, let me just say something in terms of the rationality, truth, and logic. The current position in our society means that if I feel I'm a five-foot Chinese woman, then I'm a five-foot Chinese woman. And you think, no way would anyone ever say that. There's a wonderful YouTube clip of a guy who went onto campus. I think it may even have been Harvard, and then in Sweden somewhere, I went around and said, well, I identify as a five-foot Chinese woman. And about half the people said, well, if you want to do that, that's fair enough. No, it's not. It's not. I love the Chinese. I'd love to be Chinese. But it's not. There's a kind of fight back attitude. We've got to fight them. We've got to take them on and all that kind of stuff. We've got rage against the darkness. Um, you, you can see that I like alliteration because family, you know, the uh, Christian family values. Uh, Tolkien admonished his son, each of us could healthily begin in our 30 odd years of full manhood, a few hundred children and enjoy the process. By the way, what do you think is going to happen 
when you've got all these people who are having children in different ways and we don't know who's related to who. Just the kind of time bomb that that is creating. It's reckoned that there are 12 men in, that, in the whole of the UK who are responsible for something like 10,000 children. You know it's going to happen. You see this right to have a child. You purchase a child almost. But I would argue that the way to go is faith. And faith in terms of the gospel. Um, I think we have to deal with the small stories. We do so against the backdrop of the big story. But we have the biggest story of all. 30 years ago, I had the first transgender person in my congregation in Broder. Can you believe that? In the Scottish Highlands, an Edinburgh lawyer. What a messed up, sad, confused person. And when it came out in the press that she'd actually been born a man, she was an SNP candidate, it's a complicated and long story. She told me because we'd become friends, and my wife said to me afterwards, David, you're crazy, didn't you know? I said, no, I had my clue. I said, just look at the hands. I went, I don't know, I don't look at women's hands and men's hands. I, you know, I'm a bit thick, yeah. If you've got beard, I probably think you're a man, otherwise I'm not sure. Uh, you guys are okay. <laughs> and, and then I'm, well, worry about you guys in the front, no. <laughs> but, she told me, and she, will I still be welcome in church? I said, of course you are. Of course you're welcome in church, because we welcome everyone. But I, I said, do you mind if I tell my elders, because this is going to be in the newspapers tomorrow, and it's a small village, and you can imagine. So she said, yes. You can tell them. And I remember telling my elders, I was so proud of them. I, I said to them, guys, this is what, what do we do? And Ross, who's uh, one of my elders, who's a lorry driver, he said, what do you mean, what do we do? I said, well, what do we do? He says, uh, she's a sinner the same as everybody else. Same as she was yesterday, same as she'll be tomorrow. Welcome in church, needs the gospel, same as everyone. I said, what about, she's converted and we're coming to communion and all that kind of stuff. And he said, cross that bridge when we come to it. We're all a mess, let God deal with it. I thought, yeah, good for you. Quite right. I think we need to um, recognize the devastation that internet porn is doing, even within our churches. I preached on it once, just had mentioned it in passing, and four men in my congregation came up to me separately and said, I'm struggling with this. I've had a colleague who got caught up in it and ended up committing suicide. Child sexual abuse, there are 50,000 on the sex offenders register in Britain. I thought all this child protection stuff, no, we don't need that in the church. Until one day a couple of people came up to me who were social workers and said, Dave, you see that guy? He's been in jail for abusing children. He tends to use churches. I said, thank you for telling us. You know, just, it's unbelievable, the darkness in the, in the human heart. And don't think it can't happen in the church. It can and it does. I think there are these small stories, if you like, what I mean by that, they're individual stories. There are the middle stories, the cultural trends that go on. And I think ultimately there's the ultimate big story, the gospel, which is good news for a broken society. Um, and that's what we have. I honestly think I can go to people. The, the girl I mentioned who said, uh, you know, she's a lesbian next morning. Well, I'm going to be baptizing her soon. And it's funny because she, she insists on being baptized by immersion. We don't have a pool. And I ain't going down to Tay in winter. So, <laughs> you know, I'm having to borrow a pool from somewhere. You know, just to baptize her. We'll do it. That's fine. We're Presbyterians. We're flexible. You know, we'll baptize you with any amount of water you want. Um, but it's wonderful. It's a wonderful story. And I, I, I think I can go to everybody and I can say, there's good news for you. And I think we have to say that in our society. But as a church, we must stop hiding away from the realities of these situations. <clears throat> what I've described to you is at a certain level. I, I don't preach on subjects in my church. I go through books of the Bible, but I did decide to do this because I asked so many questions one Sunday evening, and loads and loads and loads of people came. And my congregation, I, you could hear gas from people in the church. And I, I said to them at one point, I said, you need to understand that every illustration I'm giving you is not from wacky America, California. This is from Dundee. And this is not a dystopian future. This is now. This is happening now. And that's what's going on in our culture. And there's so much more. It is a very, very dark place. It is a very regressive culture. 
We have thrown away scriptures. Romans 1 is the perfect description of our culture. But I don't want you to despair because where did the gospel flourish? In that regressive culture. Because it's the answer. And I'm amazed at how many people have been converted from aberrant sexual lifestyles into biblical Christianity. By the way, I think non-biblical Christianity, A, is an oxymoron, it doesn't exist, it's not Christianity. And B, it just doesn't work. It just really does not work. I remember I read today before I came out, a friend saying, oh well, the, the, it's, I think it's the African United Methodist Church in, in uh, North America who have just voted to reaffirm the biblical position on, on homosexuality, sexuality and marriage and have been really strong about it one of their bishops stood up and said, we don't need white people to tell Africans how to behave. You know, which is what is a Western white liberal thing, largely. And good for him, it's a really powerful speech. I had this friend, uh, a leading Scottish uh, clergy person saying, oh, it's terrible, they voted themselves into extinction. I'm going, you, you are as blind as can be. Why do you think the church here is dying? Absolutely collapsing, because it just goes along with the agenda of the culture. And it's churches that stand with the word of God and proclaim Christ, who will see growth. Now, I'm not saying churches who just argue or fight politically. I'm talking about those who remain true to the word of God. And apply it and teach it and show it and demonstrate it. And bring Christ to a people who are starving. You know, we were the land of the people of the book. Not anymore. It's like in Jeremiah's time, there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Well, let's tell him. So, we'll return perhaps to this, um, to a clip from Augustine, just before we finish. But any questions or comments? Now, there's a gentleman I saw earlier who wanted to ask something. Where have you gone? You, t- you told me to prompt you. Whoever you are, can I prompt you? No, it wasn't you, but never mind. Go ahead. You can ask first. Uh, just an just, uh, observation for you. Um, yeah. About 22 years ago, um, I was at a Liberal Democrat conference where a particular individual essentially proposed that um, there, sh- there should be no um, criminal offence if sex happened between young people who were less than five years different in age. Yeah. Um, so I think that well, that didn't get very far, but um, it would not surprise me if that will, will be the, the step yeah. which will lead on from where we currently are. Yeah. It will, it, it, see, the reason it, will, it, it can easily happen is because there's nothing to stop it except public opinion. And public opinion can be, because people are confused, public opinion can be pushed all different directions. You know, that's why we need the guidance of God's Word. You know, in rejecting Christian standards, it's not that we've got this clear standard that we follow. It's that we believe anything, you know, and the, the, the mantra, love is love, you know, and when people are like, love is love, I was like, uh huh, what does that mean? Tell me, you know, so, yeah, you're right, I think it will go that direction. Yes? Um, our son and his wife um, decided to go and school our grandchild, yeah. who started school this year, yeah. um, they have another child and another one on the way. Yeah. Sunday pass. Okay. Um, so they went to see the school in relation to not registering Andrew for school and they were met by we don't know of any homeschool children uh, from the school in Barnaby and Sunshine. Um, so they asked why my son and his wife didn't want their uh, grandson to be schooled. And my son um, obviously voiced his concerns in relation to what's been taught now in primary school, um, LGBTI, etc., etc., and he was really concerned about that. And they said, um, well, off the record, we agree with you. Yeah. However, if we don't do what we're told, we will lose our jobs. Yes. So we have to agree with the curriculum yeah. in relation to allowing children to self-identify. Yeah. Um, and we can't, we can't say more. And basically because our grandson has not started school, um, there is no real um, need for the school to become involved 
as long as they're involved with DEFREC and to the grind for every child. Yeah. They will do their own curriculum, they'll be involved with other homeschool Christian yeah. families yeah. Uh, in the area. But it really it concerned, it concerned <coughs> my husband and myself because we thought, how are they going to cope with three children under the age of five, including the homeschool side of it? But we have now been, um, how could you say, uh, relaxed a little bit more in relation to it. It's not as difficult as we thought. But we are really concerned that other families are saying, why are you homeschooling and why you, you can't keep them out of the world? Yeah, well, yes, but there's a, here's a, there's an issue. I mean, I'm not a big fan of homeschooling, I have to say, but there are more and more people in my church who are doing it. But about 15 years ago in Dundee, homeschooling really took off, and it was with atheists. In fact, the leader of the homeschool movement in Scotland was an atheist, <coughs> and she was from Dundee. And that was because of what was going on in schools. And I think the question does become, yes, there are difficulties with homeschooling, but I'm sorry, I'm not sending, about half the schools in Dundee, I'm not sending my kids to. Others I would. A huge amount depends on the head teacher. I mean, I really would encourage Christians to get involved in that. However, there is an enormous seminal change that took place in Scottish society that almost no one knows. I know that Nigel did. <laughs> but, um, and it says, the trouble with the Time for Inclusive Education campaign is for the first time, a protocol was absolutely broken. Government do not tell teachers what to teach. And now we've been told by government what to teach. And so those teachers are in that problem. Yeah. Um, and it's not just even that there's a general curriculum. Once that wall was breached, government are going to tell everyone what they should be teaching about everything. And the trouble with Thai is that I think, okay, fair enough, you know, I, I mean, I could live with, yeah, well, we, you know, that the, the, in theory, it's meant to be about stopping bullying. That's good, I agree with that. Let's stop bullying. But in practice, it's about indoctrinating children into queer theory. And queer theory is what it's called itself. It's the view that I've just been going through, basically, all I've been teaching about today is, in effect, what queer theory is. And it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's just devastatingly harmful. I will not let my kids go to a restaurant where they'll be fed poison, you know. And I think this is poisonous. So I think Christians have to be really wary. I think we kind of missed the ball. I've argued for years that the Church of Scotland, the Free Church, Baptists and others, that we should have been seeking to make sure our schools remain Christian. In theory, our state schools are supposed to be Christian schools. They're non-denominational, not non-Christian. A lot of people near us, they'll send their kids to the Catholic schools, although the Catholics have become quite weak on this as well. A lot of Catholics are very, they write to me very concerned about what's happening in their schools as well. I even had one journalist, Catholic journalist, come and see me and he said, David, you know what, I'm going to propose to our bishops, because they're useless, but I'm going to propose that we give over, we stop calling our schools Catholic schools, we call them Christian schools, and can the Free Church come and run half of them? <laughs> I said, oh, the Free Church running Catholic schools, that's going to be an interesting one. Um, but, but, I do think, I mean, the trouble with Christian schooling that is, is that it's often been perceived as being small, quite elitist, a cheap way to provide middle-class parents who can't afford private education in Edinburgh, you know, with something. I think we've got to move away from that, and I think, uh, personally, if we had the guts at all, we'd go to the Scottish Government, and they told me they can't refuse this, and say, we need you to fund Christian schools, because you fund Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, you cannot refuse to fund and they will have to do it because they don't want to lose the Catholic vote. You know, they've sworn to protect Catholic schools only because of the vote, not out of any principle. So I would love to have seen that, but unfortunately what we've got is we've got parents and grandparents who are way behind um, the flow, and they're saying, oh, well, I, when I was at school, it was, yeah, when my wife was at school, she looked short of catechism in the Bible. You know, none of the stuff that's happening now so I think it's very good for parents to be informed. I think churches should be providing education for children. If not a school, at least do what the Muslims do. Do you know what the Muslims do in my city? Every day of the week, after school, they go for two hours to the mosque to learn the Quran. Can we not have one day a week where we take kids in? You know, and take it seriously? I think half an hour of Sunday school on a Sunday for kids is useless in this environment. Utterly useless. We need a whole lot more. And we need to think about that. Homeschooling may be part of it. I wasn't keen on homeschooling, but several families in my congregation now do it. And you know the advantage? 
they have a collective, they come together twice a week in the church, play games, have special lessons, so it's almost like school. So you don't, it doesn't have to be weird and wacko. You know, and while it's still legal, I think the government will make a move to make it illegal. And I think actually the European Union, more well, than Germany, it's illegal. You, you can go to jail for homeschooling your kids. So that could happen here also. Yes, sir. Would that be the same for uh, Sunday school, for instance? Is there any interference there? Uh, there was an attempt in England to do that, uh, that we should all come under offset. And offset are just weird uh, and wicked as well. Um, and I think at the moment it's not going to happen because it has to be more than four hours. I don't know of any Sunday school that's more than four hours. But, you see, we can go along with the government regulations. My, my view is simply this. I think what the Vardis have done in England is fantastic. I, I wish churches would take over run-down schools in poor areas and show what Christian teaching could I don't want I don't want Christian schools for Christian kids. I want Christian schools for everybody. I want Thomas Guthrie's ragged schools for the poor. I think the best way out of poverty is education. But I'm not the kind of education that our government's now providing, which is largely social engineering. It's not education. And so I think we should be seeking to provide that. That's a big vision. But we've got some way to go. Yes, sir. Uh, and my vocation was done some 50 years ago at the psychiatric hospital of Zaklai, who came in a male, mm -hmm. who used that word, uh, choosing a male who was diagnosed as having what they call Pleidifelter syndrome, yeah. which was a chromosomal abnormality of double X and a Y. Yeah. And I just wondered if we bring it up to the day, there might be people who have particular genetic problems yeah. who are, which, are, which are not being recognized and therefore treated. Yeah. Now, I'm not forgetting about mutilation, I'm not even thinking about that. Yeah, no, you're, you're talking about something that is a, is a genetic condition, right? Now, um, there are people who are born with disabilities, you know, and you don't say it's, you're sinful and, you know, that's... Uh, how, how many people here watch Call the Midwife? God, admit it. I did. Yeah, I do. Well, um, the call, just be careful with soap operas as well. Call the Midwife is wonderful, and it's because it's wonderful, it's dangerous. So, pushed recently, in the last three episodes, it's pushed a really strong pro-abortion. But two episodes ago, I couldn't believe it, they pushed an intersex thing. You know, I'm thinking intersex in the East End in London in the 1960s. Yeah, right, big issue. No, but they're just, all they're doing is, uh, this is what we're doing with history, by the way, we're reading back into history. If you see Mary, Queen of Scots, the film, it's, a, uh, it's almost farcical. It's Monty Python-esque in its view of, um, of the history of the time. But um, this particular thing, the intersex thing, yes, there are possibly one in a thousand. There are, there are genetic abnormalities. And what do you do with that? Well, people are human beings. And you treat them as human beings. And because as Christians, we don't think gender is everything. And we don't think sex is everything. Our society is obsessed with sex. I always say, I follow the person who remained a virgin all his life, Jesus Christ. I don't think if you don't have sex that somehow you're inadequate, not fulfilled. And I think the fact that we all of us live in messed up bodies to some degree you know, um, I, so that, the, the intersex stuff is very different from the transgender because the transgender is denying that gender and biology are associated. The intersex stuff is not saying that. In fact, it holds the opposite. So again, someone like that you would treat with compassion. And by the way, you know, there's a very conservative church in Northern Ireland that went to preach at. I was, I was laughing because there was a guy came down in the front and he was in his dress and his this, you know, red lipstick and this hat, you know, good Presbyterian church, so I had to have a woman, had to have a hat, you know. And he was clearly a guy because of the beard and everything else. Um, and I was speaking to him afterwards, and he was totally against the transgender stuff, but he just liked a bit of cross-dressing and going to women's Bible studies. All right, he was messed up. But I love the way that people just spoke to him normally. You know, that's what you do. We're messed up people. We live in a messed up world. That's the way that it is. But we are not going to make it messier by compromising on what scripture says. You know? And I think we're going to get much, many, many more of these messed up situations and messed up people coming into our churches. Why? Because the church is for the broken. You know, everyone else talks about the poor. Yeah, I, I used to laugh at this. There's a guy, um, not laugh, but smile at this. There's a guy who, when his wife became a Christian, he went off and joined the pagan society, which is my church. You know, so he wasn't very keen on what had happened. But afterwards he said to me, David, 
Do you know this? I hate everything you teach. I want everything you've got. I said, why? He says, I come to your church and it's the only place in Dundee that there are people of different backgrounds, different races, everyone all together. He says, couldn't you have that without Christ? And I said, no, it's because of Christ we've got it. So we need to remember that. You know, I do think that, the, 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 that um, you know, it's a, and, and some, you know, this, I've now reached the stage where sometimes I can't watch the news. Because I, I know what's going on and I get so depressed and so upset. And I think there's a darkness. You know, the old, old now it's the same, the same as Graham Kendrick's song, Great is the darkness that covers the earth. Come Lord Jesus. I think there's a darkness coming over Scotland. I'm, I'm, I don't want to depress you. We haven't seen anything yet. I think the place where I'm going this afternoon in the Scottish Parliament, they don't know what they're doing. And they are in a mess. Let me tell you, their lives are in a mess. They, they, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they're leading us. They're being led, actually. And it's a disaster. And I would say the UK government as well. You know. So what do we have? We have the gospel. And we have to live out that gospel in the context in which we're in. And we've got this bigger picture. So I'm not, I don't feel... I mean, we've been to Bible study recently. In fact, last Wednesday, our, our lunchtime group's meeting is a meeting right now. And they said, uh, one guy was asked what he was afraid of. And he said, oh, I'm afraid of all this transgender stuff. Which is a bit ironic because the transgender person was sitting there. And she just smiled and she said, you don't need to be afraid. And I, she was spot on. You don't need to be afraid of people. We, don't, we, we fear God and that's it. We fear God in a good way. We don't need to fear what's going on. Because none of this is new. You know, I'll finish with, with this. I like reading the early church fathers. And uh, a while ago, I was many, four or five years ago, I was reading, I can't even remember who it was, it was one of the famous ones. And, it, and there was a phrase in which she said, we are not like the Persians who marry their mothers and the Celts, the Scots, who marry their brothers. This was the third century. You know, none of this is new. There's nothing new under the sun. And this is where the gospel, the good news, comes in. And that's also, by the way, where we can say to people, I can say to any of you, you know, I, I, there are many people, I, one in four women in Britain have had an abortion. Now. When people are coming into your church from outside, as happened with us, we may be in the church all the time. I, I say to people, look, there's healing and there's forgiveness. You know, and really, we, we've, got, we've got remarkably good news, which in a world of darkness, shines even brighter. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes um, from the church fathers. Augustine, I love this. Let us love because he first loved us, or how should we love except he had first loved us? So we can love because God first loved us. By loving we became friends, but he loved us as enemies, that we might be made friends. He first loved us and gave us the gift of loving him. We did not yet love him. By loving we are beautiful. But our soul, my brothers, is unlovely because of iniquity. By loving God, it becomes lovely. What a love it is, it must be, that makes the lover beautiful. But God is always lovely, never unlovely, never changeable. He was always lovely, first loved us. And what were we when he loved us, but foul and unlovely? But he did not leave us foul. No, but he changed us. And out of the unlovely makes us lovely. How shall we become lovely? By loving him who was always lovely. As the love increases in you, so the loveliness increases. For love is itself the beauty of the soul. How do we find Jesus beautiful? And that's, in an ugly world, we want people to see the loveliness of Christ. And then finally this one. Behold, hatred shows itself winningly gentle and charity quarrels. Stay not thy regard upon the words of seeming kindness or the seeming cruelty of the, book, the rebuke. Look into the vein that they come from. Seek the root where they proceed. One is gentle and bland that he may deceive. The other quarrels that he may correct. Do you know what? I find that so encouraging. <coughs> There's a, a quarrelsomeness and a rudeness that is wrong, and a bluntness that is wrong. But my goodness, the church in, in Scotland today needs to get some backbone. We're so spineless and insipid and weak. And people get nothing from it. I'm not saying being rude and obnoxious, not at all. But we need to stand up. Be gracious and speak and correct. Well then, it's not for us brethren to enlarge your heart. Obtain from God the gift to love one another. Love all men, even your enemies. Not because they are your brothers, but that they may be your brothers. 
that you may at all times be on fire with brotherly love, whether towards him that is become my brother or towards thine enemy, so that by being beloved, you may become your brother. How does that work? I, for a number of years, from the Scottish Secular Society website. Very, very foolish. Don't do internet quarrels. But I learned my lesson. So they, I mean, just boom, 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 hatred and vitriol and everything. And uh, one day, uh, I mean, I had to eventually come off because it was so abusive and so just unbelievable. And one day, uh, I noticed that the vice president, there was a particularly tragic incident where a relative of his had died and committed suicide and so on. I just wrote a wee note and said, look, I'm really sorry about what happened with that. I left it. And then about a year and a half later, he got in touch with me privately and just said simply, David, I'd just like to apologize for a lot of stuff that I said and we allowed to be said about you. He said, through Jordan Peterson, this is bizarre, I've come to realize that most of what you said about society is true. I'm still an atheist, but he said, I'm very, very grateful for the interaction. And he and I have kept in touch, and I pray for him, and I pray that the Lord will work in his life. (coughs) By being firm with people, you don't lose them necessarily. You know, you just got to take the bullets. But we have to tell people. And this stuff that we've been looking at today, it's not a quirk, it's not an idiosyncrasy, it's real. I'll tell you this, in any primary school, but almost any head teacher tells you this. If they get three or four parents complaining, they are freaking out. They back off with stuff. Mm-hmm. Most schools where this is happening, it's one teacher who's pushing it. Just one. And we need to stand up to that and gently say, no, we're not going there. My kids are not being taught that stuff. And if they are, they're out. And, and we'll see what happens with all of that. So, thank you so much for being um, willing to listen. It's a long two hours. You've done remarkably well. If you want a copy of that, I believe we have it So here, so you can ask, or, or you can email me if you wish. Um, it's easy enough, weefly at gmail.com. Thank you for that, and I'll just maybe finish with prayer. Lord, we do live in a dark world, and we know that. We know there's a darkness within our own hearts, and yet we bless you for the light. We bless you for the sunshine that pours upon this land, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us and that our leaders and our cultural uh, gatekeepers would see sense. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would have mercy upon your people and that there will be a renewal of hearing the word of the Lord and many more people coming to know you. For that is most what our society requires, the salt and light of Christian people. And help us to be that in whatever small way that we can. In your name. Amen. Amen.